Support for Ask a Christian Counselor comes from Faithful Counseling, which provides online professional counseling from a biblical perspective. Speak with a Christian licensed therapist today from the comfort of your home or anywhere you are on the go. For 10% off your first month, visit faithfulcounseling.com slash ACC. On today's show, dealing with a dysfunctional family. This is Ask a Christian Counselor where you can receive solid, practical, and biblical answers on whatever personal or relational issue you are facing. Tress Adames is a master's level pastoral counselor in Phoenix, Arizona. Here's Tress. Hi, my name is Tress, and welcome to the show. Well, we are coming up on Christmas very soon uh, from the time of me recording this. I uh, actually am done with my sessions for the week, but wanted to record this podcast Uh, This is, honestly, I feel like this is part of my job, this is part of my ministry, is providing this podcast, and it's my way of giving back to um, pretty much the community of counseling, and people who are just looking for advice from a biblical perspective on various topics. And I got an email that I want to read real quick that will dive right into what we're going to be talking about today. And this uh, email says, I've been listening to your podcast and reading your online resources. You have a lot of resources for managing relationships between adults, family, and with children, but nothing specific to adult children dealing with troubled parents. For context, my husband's mother is an extremely troubled person. She recently left my father-in-law after 30 years uh, to get married to an old high school boyfriend who has proven to be unsafe Uh, to be around children. We have attempted multiple times to confront her in love and truth, but when confronted with things she doesn't like, she becomes manipulative, deceitful, um, and will twist responsibility of her actions onto others. We have attempted to set boundaries kindly and firmly, but she becomes belligerent, and when we do, and she call, and when we do, she calls us mean and selfish. She claims that God has forgiven her, so we should too. For her, this means she should be allowed to visit us with her new husband. Even though we dislike the idea of our children growing up without a grandmother, the risk of exposing our child to her husband is not worth it to us and not a boundary she is willing to accept. I feel like we're at an impasse for a working relationship and the only place we have left to go is by setting boundaries with extremely limited contact. None of us like this idea, but we're not going to budge on the safety of our children. What information or advice can you share for our situation or situations for adult children with troubled parents in general? All right. Well, thank you for this question. Um, this is honestly a topic that I have actually been working on for a while, and that is the issue of dysfunctional families. And it's specifically, you know, how can somebody who is an adult deal with another adult uh, in a difficult situation like this? Well, like I said, I've been working on research regarding this for a while. So I am a part of the American Association of Pastoral Counselors, and we are working on a certification for counselors and for pastors and for really just anybody that's in a helping profession uh, in regard to uh, well various topics. We're, we're creating a certification that will pretty much focus on Uh, spiritually integrated care. And I was asked to do one of the modules for this. And the one that I decided to work on was on marriage and family therapy. And, you know, even just for pastors, pastors are expected to be experts on the family. And (laughs) honestly, a lot of them don't feel like they're equipped. So I wanted to create my module on, uh, you know, how to work with families that are struggling. And so I pulled a lot of uh, information from um, what's known as family systems theory or family systems therapy. And uh, there is one book in the pastoral counseling world called Generation to Generation, written by Edwin Friedman. And he pretty much kind of wrote the book on family therapy in regard to pastoral counseling. But I kind of want to talk about some of his, his concepts in the book and some of the insights that he gives just on how families work and how they become dysfunctional. But, you know, this issue also comes up a lot around the holidays and a lot around Christmas because, you know, we're 
you know, forced, I don't want to say forced, but we tend to, we tend to be around family a lot, <laughs> extended family, family we may have not seen in months, or maybe that we only see once a year. And I know that there are some people who really dread this time of year because there are certain family members that they don't want to see, uh, that they have issues with. There's probably unforgiveness that's still there, uh, things that have happened in the past. And so being around certain family members brings up a lot of hurt for them. And so, you know, even counseling clients this time of year can be very difficult because, you know, a lot of their trauma might be triggered being around certain people. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they want to be around family. So they want to know, well, how can I set boundaries with certain family members uh, as needed? Just like this question has mentioned. And also around Christmas, uh, we have a lot of movies uh, that <laughs> that I like to watch. And one of them is Christmas Vacation uh, with Chevy Chase. And to me, it just, <laughs> it just very much exemplifies what a dysfunctional family is around Christmas. Want to play one of my uh, favorite scenes real quick and then we'll jump into this. You want to hurry this up, Clark? I'm freezing my baguettes off. 250 strands of light, 100 individual bulbs per strand for a grand total of 25,000 imported Italian twinkle lights. Hey! 25,000. Well, I hope nobody I know drives by and sees me standing in the yard staring at the house in my pajamas. If they know your dad, they won't think anything of it. Oh. Fire it up, Dad! I dedicate this house to the Griswold family Christmas. Oh. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. Oh, oh, uh... Beautiful, Clark. Oh, talk about pissing your money away. Oh, I hope you could see what a silly waste of resources this was. You worked really hard, Grandma. So do washing machines. Well, if you've seen the movie, uh, you know that things only get worse throughout the story. Uh, to the point where Clark Griswold, played by Chevy Chase, pretty much has a nervous breakdown by the end of the movie. And, you know, it, it's all played up uh, for laughs. It, it's a comedy. In fact, most comedies, most sitcoms, center around dysfunctional families. And while it's fun for us to watch this on the screen, you know, living in it is not so fun. And, you know, what I notice, even just from that short little scene, is just how, well honestly how mean uh, certain family members can be to one another you know the people that are supposed to be the closest to us we can be you know very nasty to and this happens especially in dysfunctional families and so you know what do you do if you're in this type of situation where you have family members that just walk all over you that just say very vicious things uh, maybe they have very dysfunctional behaviors or are in dysfunctional relationships and they bring somebody around that you don't approve of and you don't want around your kids. What do you do? Well, we want to kind of understand why families are the way they are. And we can get that from family systems theory. And so according to Edwin Friedman in his book, Generation to Generation, and I'll put a link to some of these resources uh, in the description, he talks about how Every family has a homeostasis. And really, you can't understand the individuals in a family until you just look at the whole and you look at the whole family as a system. And, you know, there is a status quo for every family. In fact, you may have even heard the term growing up. This is how we have always done things or this is how it's always been. And that homeostasis, it's, it's very hard to break that. And so when you set boundaries with another family member, it's going to upset that balance. It's going to upset how things have always been. And so families just by default are resistant to change. 
And so even when you're trying to become healthy, uh, the family can sabotage that. Whether or not they intend to, it's just what happens. And Friedemann, in his book, he talks about how, you know, this happens not just in families, this happens in workplaces, it happens in churches, and he says that the most ruthless corporations, no less churches and synagogues, often will tolerate and adapt to troublemaking complainers and downright incompetence, whereas the creative thinker who disturbs the balance of things will be ignored if not let go. And man, that's so true. I don't know if if you have, you know work uh, experience in that regard. But yeah, the the most emotionally, probably immature person in a family or a church or uh, a workplace ends up controlling everybody else. While those who are trying to strive to make everything better or trying to challenge the status quo, they're the ones who are demonized. And so this is unfortunately just part of it. And this is something that I tell clients who you know, come to counseling and they're working on boundaries with family members. I tell them, you know, you are going to upset the status quo. So do not be shocked when you are met with anger, uh, with misunderstanding, uh, with people just even accusing you of being selfish. You're going to upset the balance. You're going to rock the boat. And so it's going to cause a lot of conflict. Because I think, honestly, you know, if, if boundaries are, are something you know, a concept that you're learning, uh, you know, you know how you want things to be. And so sometimes maybe, you know, we might kind of assume that other people are going to understand why we're setting boundaries and why it's healthy. And maybe we might even go into it, into it with rose colored glasses. But in reality, what happens is it might actually make things worse before they get better. And so you're, you're upsetting the default and it's going to cause conflict. And that's where I think a lot of people who set boundaries probably give up. You know, man, I, you know, I tried to set boundaries, um, but, you know, they just didn't understand. And so I just backed off. I just gave up. And so, you know, I remind my clients, just keep going. You have to keep pushing through. It's going to get worse before it gets better because you really have to train family members how to treat you and pretty much letting them know this is the new normal. And I'm not going to go back to how things were where I just let people walk all over me. Uh, They're going to have to learn. And over time, they will adjust and they will get used to it. But the first part of that is really hard. So I encourage, you know, if this is something that you're struggling with, is set boundaries. And if you don't know how to set boundaries, uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the description just on an article I wrote called How to Set Boundaries, as well as a link to the book Boundaries written by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. Excellent book. One of the It is a book that every single Christian should read because uh, it's an important concept that we need to know in order to have healthy families and healthy churches. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult process to do to set boundaries, but it's something that we have to do in order to be healthy. We can't say yes to everybody. We have to say no to somebody. In fact, every, every no to somebody is a yes to something else. And every yes is a no to something else. And so we might say yes to somebody else and somebody else's desires, but then we say no to ourselves and even no to our own families. And so uh, in reality, you're always going to have to disappoint somebody. And that's the thing also with dysfunctional families is, you know, there's uh, depending on the family. Um, but if you're in a family that's, that's very dysfunctional and very dramatic, Uh, where people are just constantly getting angry with each other. The thing is, no matter what you do, you're going to make somebody angry. So might as well make them angry uh, in a way that puts you in a better position to where you feel uh, more protected emotionally in the process of making boundaries. So you're going to upset things anyway. Might as well upset them in a way that puts you in a better place personally. And in the lives of your family and your children as well. And so, you know, to this this uh, listener that sent us this question, I said, you know, yeah, you have to set boundaries and it's going to be misunderstood and turned around and thrown back in your face and it feels like it's going to backfire, but do not back down. Because eventually, you know, if people really care about you, they'll adjust and they'll, um, they will recognize that they still want to have a relationship with you 
And if it's on certain terms, they may not like it, but eventually they're going to have to learn how to in order to have a relationship with you. Um, and so Friedman, in his book, he also uses an example of two types of electrical connections. And what this scene from Christmas Vacation reminds me of is this example that Friedman gives. Uh, so there are two types of electrical connections. There is a series and a parallel. And probably the easiest way to understand this is through Christmas lights. Now, I'm not that old, but I remember the older Christmas lights that if one went out, they all went out. And in fact, that's actually in this scene from Christmas Vacation. Uh, Clark Griswold's dad says to him, you know, have you checked every single light? Because, you know, once one goes out, they all go out. And that's how the, the old Christmas lights used to be. If one light in a strand went out, every single light in that strand went out. Uh, and typically people would string different strings of lights together. And so if one went out, you had to go through every single strand, every single light bulb to find the one that had burned out. And then once you were able to replace it, then they would all turn on again. Now, the newer Christmas lights are better, probably, honestly, the more expensive ones that you get, um, because each light bulb is connected to the power source. So if one goes out, only that one goes out, or only a couple go out. And so that's what's known as a parallel connection. Um, and so Friedman uses this example uh, by explaining how in certain families, some families are more like the older Christmas lights, the series uh, connection, where if one person goes out or one person essentially has you know, an emotional issue, the rest of the family goes out. The rest of the lights go out. One, one bulb goes out. The rest of the lights go out. One family member has a problem. Everybody has a problem. And so the emotional energy essentially affects the entire family. Um, and, you know, some families are like that, where you, if, if mom is not happy or if dad is not happy, then the kids aren't happy and none of the extended family is happy. Or if, you know, even if the kids are acting up, then it, is, it affects the parents and it's just a whole domino effect that affects the entire family. And what Friedman says is that, you know, probably a healthier uh, family situation is one that's more like the parallel connections. Each person is connected to their own spiritual source. And so if one person goes out, it doesn't affect the rest of the family. Or if, you know, if your spouse or your kids um, has a meltdown, like it doesn't affect you because you are connected to the true spiritual source, to God himself. And so while, you know, it, you can have empathy for others, it doesn't dim your light. It doesn't completely take you out either. Your, your emotional so support is solely in God himself in your relationship with Christ. And as a result, you're really able to be there truly for that person when that happens. And what Friedman calls that is self-differentiation. And self-differentiation means that you have the ability to be a separate person in your family um, that is separate from the family but still connected. And... I want to just describe what, how, he, how he explains self-differentiation. He says that it is the capacity of a family member to define his or her own life's goals and values apart from surrounding togetherness pressures to say I when others are demanding you and we. And so what happens is somebody who is emotionally mature is self-differentiated. They have the ability to be non-anxious when everybody else in the family is anxious. Excuse me, I don't know why my voice is going out today, probably because I've been talking with people all day long. So I just ask that you bear with me. Um, water is not seem, seeming to help, so hopefully I'm not getting sick. But anyway, uh, so being a self-differentiated person allows you to be a better spouse. It allows you to be a better parent. So when the kids are freaking out, you're not freaking out. Because one of the worst things you can do is to react uh, to kids that are having a fit. Because then pretty much the roles are reversed and you're simply telling the kid, calm me down. You calm me down through your behavior. And it just, it, again, it, it creates this atomic explosion. 
And this is how couples can get into these uh, really knock down, drag out fights where one person reacts, the other person reacts, and soon they're just shouting at each other and they don't even understand how the conversation even began. But the more mature that a person can be in a family and in a relationship, the stronger um, the family can be. Now, n- no family is probably, well, according to Friedman at least, is 100% like the parallel connection where each bulb is getting its light source from the main source. Um, And, you know, not every family is exactly like the old-fashioned series parallel circuit of the old Christmas lights where if one goes out, they all go out. Most families tend to be kind of in between the two extremes and probably might even move around depending on the context and what time of year and where the family is as a whole just that year (laughs) during that season of life. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we're individually moving toward that place of self-differentiation where we understand where we begin and somebody else, uh, where we end and somebody else begins, where something is no longer our responsibility, it's somebody else's responsibility. And, you know, when we set boundaries, that is an act of self-differentiation. You are recognizing that, you know, something is stepping over into your territory. It is violating, you know, your personhood, um, somebody else's behavior, maybe their addictive behavior or their dys- dysfunctional behavior, and you have to set boundaries. And we want to do it in love. We want to speak the truth in love. But understand that, yeah, it's it's not going to be understood. The other person's not going to get it because you are threatening, again, the way things have always been. And so if you're in a dysfunctional family situation, you know, I encourage you, learn more about boundaries, understand why they're biblical. I mean, you might even have family members that accuse you of not being a good Christian by setting boundaries because they don't understand uh, what it means to be a healthy, emotionally healthy Christian. And, you know, I've had a lot of clients that just feel crushed when a family member accuses them of not doing, you know, the, the righteous uh, Christian thing when in reality <laughs> what the other person is doing is not Christian. And so don't let that uh, don't let that trouble you. Don't let that uh, crush your spirit. Um, sometimes, you know, in order to say yes to God, we have to say no to other people. And sometimes that means saying no to the people that we love. And so, again, I encourage you uh, to check out Boundaries. It's a good book. I'll put the link in the description as well as our article on how to set boundaries. Well, um, one of the best ways that you can understand your own family and other family members is through what is known as a genogram. And what a genogram is, is a pretty much a family tree, but it is one that's a little bit more detailed and can kind of unveil a lot of these type of you know, type of uh, situations where, you know, you might want to kind of understand why your family is the way it is, um, understand certain family roles and how certain family members might be more enmeshed and, um, you know, how it affects everybody else. So a genogram is just a drawing, really, where you can plot out your own family. Uh, and, if you're a counselor, you can help other clients do the same. Or if you're a Bible study leader, you, leader, you can help uh, people in your family um, understand their family members more efficiently. And so uh, we have a resource, and I just call it uh, Genograms for, for Beginners. And uh, it just shows you step-by-step how to create a genogram and how to teach other people to do the same. And then also there's questions that originally came from the Emotionally Healthy Church written by Peter Scazzaro. And there's certain questions that you answer in your group or even just to yourself about your family so that you can kind of understand what why your family is the way it is. Uh, for example, the, some of the questions are, describe each family member with two or three adjectives, parents, caretakers, grandparents, siblings, children. Number two, describe your parents or your caretakers and grandparents' marriages. Number three, how is conflict handled in your extended family over two to three generations? How is anger handled? How was, how was role, certain roles handled? 
Uh, what were certain generational themes? What were big, huge earthquake events that happened? And how did that affect the family? And so you create the genogram and then you go through the questions. And, you know, hopefully it, it teaches you more about your family of origin, the context in which you were raised, and then ultimately teaches you more about yourself and how that affected you and, you know, maybe how you're still connected in the same ways uh, that you were growing up. And maybe there's some areas that you realize that you could go through, grow through. And so uh, I suggest we have this, again, we have this resource. It's just called Genograms for Beginners. If you're interested, we have it on a new platform um, for therapists. It's not a platform that we've created, but it's a, a platform that somebody else has created for therapists called Practicat. And they have a lot of resources and um worksheets and ebooks and all types of different things for counselors in private practice. But anyway, we'll put a link to our product and you can check it out if this is something you want to do. You want to plot out your own family. You want to understand yourself more. Maybe you're leading a Bible study and you would like to do a study on families. Totally suggest having everybody listen to this podcast and then also break out the genogram and learn one another, learn more about one another's families. Well, I want to remind each and every one of you that you are made in the image of God and he loves you unconditionally. Walk in this knowledge and get support when you forget. God bless. Before we begin, since this is Aunt Bethany's 80th Christmas, I think she should lead us in the saying of grace. Oh, great. Oh. What, dear? Grace! Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. They want you to say grace. The blessing! Hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. 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 Amen.